I'm Clinton Anderson. And I've traveled to the Australian outback to capture a rogue Brumby. Encountering deadly challenges along the way. And now, after catching him once, we've got to track him down again. To track down this rogue, I'll need the help of the Aboriginals, as well as Dr. Chris Pollock. Some might say it's never gonna happen, and I'm engaged in a lost cause, wasting my time. But once I'm on a mission, I never turn back, mate. Down Under Horsemanship's Australian Outback Adventure is brought to you by Ritchie Industries. Fresh water for life. I'm Clinton Anderson, and I have a method for training horses. Getting horses to behave is simple. It's training people that's the real trick. Join me as I tackle some of the most challenging situations with problem horses and with problem owners. Tracking a wild horse that has escaped in the wild outback is not an easy feat. And this horse has proven especially elusive. You know, this rogue Brumby was very crafty. So I knew if we were ever gonna get him back in the pen, we had to get on this quickly before he got too far away from the yards, okay? Time was of the essence. We're gonna have to get out there with our Aboriginal trackers who are recognized as some of the best trackers in the world and these fellas will track that horse to the very end. How can the team of Anselm, David, Ian, Chris, Pollitt and Edric track down this rogue Brumby? And what can we learn about wild Brumby's biology in the process? Our strategy to get him back was to do it quickly. So to do that, we had to break up into teams. By us spreading out in small teams, we could cover a lot more ground and also do it quickly. Because remember, every second counts. The further he gets away, the less chance we're ever gonna get him back in. Ian put me with Anselm. He was their best Aboriginal tracker. He knew the country from the back of his hand. So I felt confident. Now Anselm, this wild Brumby that we are trying to track down now, have you ever come across one that was harder to track than him? Nah, this one's by far the worst. Yeah, because you guys have been trying to get him in the yards now for quite a while, yep. haven't you? Yeah. I tell you, I was upset. We finally had him in the yards, and then he, it was just a stupid mistake, and he got out. But if, if all goes well, we'll try to get him back in again. Because I tell you what, a 10-year-old rogue stallion like that, that'll be a good challenge. I'm looking forward to it. Wow. Now, if he, if he catches wind of us, we're going to have to be right up his butt, eh? Because yep. he's going to gallop off, so we're going to have to be ready to try to get around him, mate. That's right. You think he's going to be by himself or you think he's going to have a herd with him? Yeah, he'll be all on his own. Yeah, because we busted up his herd dynamics, so he's yep. going to have to obviously go track down a new herd and start all the dynamics again, herd pecking order. Yep. You know, it's interesting, when Ansel and I were riding around, we were tracking the wild Brumby. I was actually riding a, a captured Brumby. And we had to ride over lots of different terrain. I mean, we did miles and miles and miles. We had deep sand, we had rocks, we had hills, we had crevices, you know, uh, canyons, you name it. We basically went through it. We covered a lot of miles in a few days. And I gotta tell you, that horse stood up to that work like you wouldn't believe. I was pretty impressed with that horse. I wanted to know everything I possibly could about these Brumbies in Australia, how they interacted with each other, how they traveled, what their diet was. And Dr. Chris Pollitt was the guy to give me all that knowledge, very, very knowledgeable man about the Australian Brumbies. The Brumby is the wild or feral horse of Australia. They occur right across the continent. There's some in the snowy mountains that everybody's heard about. There's some in the good cattle pastures of central Queensland. There's some right down in uh, the south of Victoria, 
And then there's these ones in the desert, the desert brumby. And these are probably the toughest of them all. They thrive in this country because there are natural pastures that are so rich that they can get fat in the, when the rains come, breed rapidly, and then they're tough enough to survive the dry times. Their hooves, the gift of evolution to the horse, these tough, hard hooves can take them across country and cover many, many kilometres between the essential water one day, three or four days later, they need to come back from the feeding grounds and they'll travel the trails and take a drink of water and then do it all over again. Ansel and Clinton split off and search to the south while Edric and David cover the property to the north. Nobody in the entire country of Australia has a more in-depth knowledge of the Australian wild brumby than Dr. Chris Pollock. It's just a fact. He is the foremost expert in the country on these horses. When it actually came down to tracking the wild brumbies, that's when Anselm's skill set was phenomenal. He could tell what direction they went. You know, he was picking up on clues and signs that I would have missed. So, you know, without him, I would have been lost completely. Anselm, where did you learn to track animals like this in the outback? Uh, I learned from my grandfather and my old man. Right? Yep. What do you see? Which direction do you think he went now? I think they're going up and past them big scrubs over there. Right up. Well, let's head over there then, mate. Yep. Did you and your father do a lot of hunting with when you were tracking them? Yep, they taught me when I was a little boy. Anselm and I had found some really good uh, fresh Brumbury tracks. So we got Dr. Chris Pollitt involved so he could educate me a little bit more about what the tracks were doing, what they were meaning. We've got some interesting footprints here. Right. You can see this one, for instance. You can tell straight away that this is the front foot of that stallion. Right. And this is his hind foot and he's moving at some speed. Okay, so he's cantering. Yeah, he's cantering. So they're the three steps right Absolutely. there. Absolutely, that's a back foot. Yep. Here's another back foot. So this front foot has landed like that because he's going to prop onto that yep. and that use the front leg as a fulcrum. Mm -hmm. And then the hind so he's foot. He's dug is, that out. Yep. But the hind foot's going to come down, spear in in front of his body weight, and then thrust off to give him that momentum. Right. But you can see when he speared in, all of this sand was pushed forward. Mm -hmm. That didn't happen there. That foot lands flat. This one doesn't land quite so flat. And then, of course, you see the big yeah. dirt out the front here and that's to leave her off and push away. So they're pulling themselves with their front legs? Pulling with the front, pushing off with the hind. But you can see this beautiful rim on the outside. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a horseshoe, a natural, right. natural horseshoe. And the, and the dome of the sole has been left there, almost like a sculpture. Step up your horsemanship with the Clinton Anderson Method. Now available in a complete set. Fundamentals starts you on your journey to ultimate control. As you learn to communicate with your horse, earn his trust and respect, and gain control of his body. Intermediate opens the door to ultimate performance as you build on your knowledge to create a safe, willing and supple partner you control with a feather-like touch. And now, all new, Advanced, delivers ultimate inspiration to fine-tune your application of the method and reach the highest level of horsemanship. Clinton Anderson offers you the ultimate collection of his wildly popular training method kits at a packaged price. The horse has been evolving for many millions of years and it reached the climax of its evolution in recent times. There are five or six different uh, species of horse and uh, 
the one we deal with, Equus caballus, we were able to domesticate. But it evolved to be tough and hardy. It had these ever-growing hooves that um, enabled it to cover large distances without injury, protecting the soft tissues inside. And it needed certain quality of pasture. It needed water every few days in its life. And it needed the areas to roam to be able to gather enough pasture into its digestive system. And it needed territory to be able to maintain their bands, not too close to each other, but to be able to move through between bands and reach the water and reach the pasture. It seems to me when you fly in a helicopter over the, uh, this country and you see the valleys that are green and the, you see the pasture on top of the mountains that they reach sometimes when it dries out in the, in the bottom of the valleys, you see bands across the plain. Wherever you look, you see little groups of horses working. And it's like going back in time to when the horse evolved. And if I could imagine evolution repeating itself, this is where the horse would have evolved. Not North America, where they went extinct, but here. And we introduced them and they thrived. They loved it. Nobody in the world has a more in-depth knowledge of the Australian wild brumby than Dr. Chris Pollard. The way that they interact as a herd, their herd dynamics, their travel patterns, uh, you know, what they eat. He has a wealth of information about this breed of horse. I was very lucky to meet this man and get to learn from him. What impact does the environment have on these horses, mate? Well, the horse in this environment, he can come for a drink and over the months of the dry times, all the feed will be eaten out. Mm -hmm. And they'll trek for 10, 15 miles back to the feeding grounds. And then after three or four days without a drink, they'll come all the way back. Mm -hmm. And when they get close to the water, they'll start trotting. Little foals, Why is pregnant that? mares. Just excited or why do they trot? Oh, when they they know that they're going to get a drink. They're right. deadly thirsty. Yeah, yeah. And it's absolutely essential that they get that drink. So what is the longest period of time that you found horses have to get water? Is it every third day or fourth day or yeah, can they three go or five four days? days? We went, we radio tracked horses that went 10 days without a drink. Right. And then the next day they were back in the feeding grounds, a long way away from that water. Mm -hmm. So they travel pretty quickly back. The thing that determines the survivability of horses in this sort of environment is their teeth. When they wear out their teeth and can't chew this tough pasture any longer, they will starve and get weak and be left. But we've found 25-year-old mares still in the environment, still with the band. And we have just as many bands of bachelors roaming this country as we do bands of mares and foals. And the bachelor herds can get quite large because there's no pressure on them. And the young colts, they uh, herd each other up and fight and rear up and do all the stallion battles and practice for when they're going to be involved in a serious challenge. And sometimes we've seen stallions uh, almost you know, fight until one is exhausted or one is critically injured. You've seen them kick onto the shoulder and the horse hobble away on three legs, and that's the finish of that battle. Maybe the old stallion, the existing herd stallion, that gets that kick, but they fight furiously, particularly in the breeding part of the year. You know, Dr. Chris Pollitt and Anselm as a team working with me was a great combination but time was of the essence. It was slipping by, it was getting later and later, and uh, I was really starting to worry that we were not gonna capture this Brumby again. You know, I, at this point, I don't know if we're gonna get the job done. We got the knowledge, we got the desire, but it, it's not looking good. Well, I think Clinton will be a, a fairly good tracker. He's an ex-Aussie, uh, and I think with the aid of Aboriginal trackers, Clinton should do very well with tracking. And I know that he'll learn very quickly. He's a good horseman. And it seems to me that Clinton is a very good bushman, so that there shouldn't be any problem with him learning the technique of tracking from our Aboriginal trackers. They've got native pastures here that are called desert oats. And the little oat heads are not as big as the domestic oats, but yep. the little oat heads have got milk in them when they've mm -hmm. just sprouted. And the horses just munch it. 
non-stop and you've seen them they, they grow fat in after years of drought they, they can become fat they breed better than you can right. breed in Kentucky and uh, the stallions can more energy they can gather up more mares into their bands and they thrive mm -hmm. they thrive better than cattle do the, the ruminants have to travel a certain distance mm -hmm. and stop and ruminate from their food. Right, and a horse doesn't need to the, do that. The horse that. Never, doesn't need to do that. It can munch and walk, munch and walk constantly. Now, a horse will eat more forage than a cow? Yeah, will, uh, but its digestive system is actually less efficient, but because it's got food in its uh, intestines constantly, and it's digesting it constantly in the end, over 24 hours, it's got more energy out of that food than a cow can. Yeah. So they thrive here. Hmm. And that's why their breeding numbers are so strong. Absolutely, we've, got Absolutely. Man, we've had, mind you, three really good years when the native pastures are, and the reason why this was um, Tempe Downs, a quite a successful cattle and horse raising yeah. property. And that's why we've still got the Brumbies here. Create the ultimate training conditions with the Clinton Anderson Signature Series from Bayland Country. The Patience Pole, conceived and designed by Clinton to teach patience and respect while protecting both horse and handler. Made with an industrial grade bearing that never requires lubrication, the poles are attractive and require virtually no upkeep. Get the Clinton Anderson Signature Series from Bayland Country. There is no other like it. Horsemanship's Australian Outback Adventure is brought to you by Richie Industries. Fresh water for life. The age of these horses, um, difficult to be exact, but uh, the average seems to be 15 to 20. They're the older horses in the band. We have encountered a, a, a mare that we were pretty sure had no teeth left, it was over 30. So. Some can survive quite a long period of time. There's no geriatric care, there's nobody to mix up mashes for the horses if they get very old. You know, the domestic horse now can be very old. We're looking after older and older horses. Veterinarians specialise in geriatric horse care. That's not available here, so they're, they live for as long as their teeth will function. We clocked one particular mare, we put a radio collar on her, and she did, a, she did about 105 miles in 10 days going to and from water. And in those 10 days, she only drank water twice. So you went four days with one drink of water and then another few days with only another drink of water. So it shows how adaptable, how versatile horses are. They can survive without water and they stay lean. They don't develop any obesity. There's no problems with insulin resistance amongst these horses. No equine metabolic syndrome here. Dr. Chris Pollitt and I came across a small herd of wild brumbies, but we had to be quiet so that we could kind of half sneak up on them to kind of see what they're doing and learn more about them. Now, Dr. Pollitt and I have just spotted some wild brumbies. They're over this ridge. So we're gonna try and sneak over there and see if we can uh, see them and talk about what's going on. We gotta be really quiet. They're very, very skittish. The stallion was just opposite that tree over there. Right. Just over there. If we go and we might just be able to see before he sees us. So where should we go? I think if we go in there, we've got the cover of those bushes. Right. You and I could go to those two trees and okay. go to that bush. That mare will lead them off. But they might come towards us. The stallion might come towards us. As, as a sort of defense. What's he looking at? There might be other horses over the other side. Oh, the one in the foreground is definitely a stallion. There could be two patchiness. I haven't seen any mares yet. They may be over the rise. You know, we realized the rogue Brumby was not in this group, so at that point we just kind of moved on. 
But again, any time that I can learn more about them, it was increasing my knowledge, it was gonna give us a better chance of capturing the horse we were looking for. These horses stay lean, they're exercising every day. It's part of their lifestyle to be moving to and from water. They move while they walk over the pastures, eating this pasture, eating that particular species, moving through the environment. So they never become obese. Of course, the problem or the lesson for the owners of domestic horses is that is the normal. And you let horses get obese, you feed them too much and they don't exercise they will become insulin resistant. Uh, and we see an epidemic of this in Australia, the United States, all over Europe. Horses getting too fat, too little exercise. And interestingly, particularly for me, a horse foot scientist, they develop laminitis. You know, our research has shown a direct link between high insulin in the blood, hyperinsulinemia, and laminitis. Dr. Chris Pollitt has a PhD from the University of Queensland, and I was really lucky to be able to walk with this man, learn about the Australian Wild Brumby, and have him on our team. Without his knowledge, I would have been really in the dark on a lot of the things that I needed to know. So this is a pad through this um, pasture, and you can see that over the years, it's been excavated down below the level of the surrounding soil and pasture. And the manure that you see on the trail will be from a mare or a foal, it won't be a stallion. The stallion here will wait until he finds a pile where the other stallions have defecated. And he will defecate there. Not a lot, but he will mark that pile of manure. That's a dung pile. And it tells all of the other stallions that I'm here. Look out. While tracking, they came across a dung pile. This is one of these stallion dung piles I was telling you about. Right. So this is the, the signpost. What do you mean by that? Like what's... Well, a stallion will come here and drop two or three turds. Right. And then he'll likely urinate on it. So he's really putting... So all of this is just for one stallion? No, 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 no. Every stallion that comes by here will so add So why to are they all adding to it? Well, each one is trying to dominate the other with the urine and the feces he's <laughs> trying to. So it's kind of like a turd war. Okay, we've heard of it. Yeah, so they're trying to drown out the scent of any other stallion. And uh, when the mare sniffs this, she'll think, oh, um, Fred's here. Fred's <laughs> he, he's here. cool. <laughs> or maybe it was Jack. Clinton came home from the bar. Yeah, okay, I'm with you. They keep adding to it, and it's loaded with pheromones. This is the, it's loaded with scents that um, uh, the stallions know that mm -hmm. there's a very dominant stallion here, mm -hmm. or I've knocked him off before, I'll be able to take a mare off him. Right. So they come and sniff and go through a, a ritual of behaviour when they do that. They okay. smell it, sometimes they do flame them, you know, curl their lips up. Yep and uh, then they'll walk over it and drop a few drops of urine on it and then a couple of steps more and I'll defecate on it. Add to the pile. So that would have been added to this morning by two or three stallions who came by along that trail that we just followed. We'll be right back with more from the Australian Outback presented by Richie Industries. Well, Leon, here we are, mate, in the middle of the outback, and this is the first official Richie Waterer to be in Australia in the outback, correct? Oh, yeah, that's exactly right. Well, you know, it just stands to reason that Richie Waterers make the very best, toughest, most durable, automatic watering system for all livestock. So if any water is going to put up with abuse, it's going to be Richie Waterer, and that's what needs to happen here, because in the middle of the outback here, it's tough. You've, you've seen the horses, you've seen the animals, you've seen the kind of abuse that everything goes on out here. You've got to have a waterer that puts up with it. Well, we've seen a lot of abuse out here, but we have confidence that this water will hold up. Yeah. With its construction, polyethylene, plastic with the polyurethane insulation is rugged. I still haven't seen an animal out here that's going to well, tear is, it up. This is the exact same water that I use on my range. That's Every correct. day. Well, Leon, we've talked a lot about Richie and what they do for the outback and the horses. Let's go out and catch some more wild brumbies and get them trained, mate. Sounds like a plan. While tracking, Clinton and Chris found a water hole that might have been visited recently by the rogue. 
Hey Clinton, the horses are still coming here even though there's not much water. You can see fresh tracks all around here. And even dingo tracks, that dingo we saw. Yep. He had a drink too. So once this dries up, they're just going to have to go a lot further than Absolutely. Water. At the moment, it's really luxury for them because they've got pasture here and mm -hmm. pasture over in the sand hills and they can come back for a drink because that sand hill water will disappear before this. Mm -hmm. So they're still drinking here, even though it's muddy. But when it's dried and cracked and gone, they'll have to do that big migration over to the permanent water hole, mm -hmm. the permanent water on the other side of that range. Yeah. I think that's the biggest thing that people don't understand about horses is they're meant to travel. They're designed to do a lot of miles under their feet, not stand around all day. That's right. From the day they're born. Yeah, from as soon as they take their first breath of air, they're designed to get up and get moving. That's right. Right, Amaya, let's keep moving. Next, Professor Chris spotted some fresh hoof prints, giving clues that they might be close. We've got uh, adult horses here, the large footprints, but here's a, here's a baby footprint. This is probably the hind foot, and that's probably the front foot. Would be seven or eight months old. The mother will be eight months pregnant, another three months to go, and then that foal will be weaned and will have to fend for itself. It'll stay in the band. One thing Professor Chris knows a lot about is the desert brumby hoof. This is the desert brumby hoof, and it's getting a trim. Hoof walls being beveled, toes being beveled, just like a hoof trimmer might do with his rasp. But every step this horse takes, the sand is shaping the hoof, the stones, wherever it hits, is a, a mark on the stone and a, a little bit of shaving away of the hoof. And we think that when this hoof makes contact, the triangular frog here pushes the dirt forward and takes out this little quarter here. So that's why we have that little gullet there between the heel and the toe. But unlike the Mustangs that we've heard about, they don't have a square toe. We've got groups of horses from Dr. Hampson and our research that do have a square toe but we think they're afraid of the crocodiles and they don't go to the water's edge and they dig holes back from the water's edge and square off the toe. And the American Mustang might be digging through the ice and snow to get pasture and using its hooves and squaring its toe. So this is the gift of evolution that uh, we've got here. An ever-growing hoof. The hoof grows every minute of the horse li horse's life there's new cells being added to the top of the hoof and it's growing downwards and what is lost to abrasion and stones is replaced from above, above. so it's an ever-growing hoof the secret of success of the desert brumby Luckily for Clinton and Chris, the footprints are probably those of the rogue and the two mares he's traveling alongside. When we came across those fresh hoof prints, Chris Pollard and Anselm analyzed them as well, and we felt like, you know what, we were right on the heels of the rogue Brumby. It kind of lifted everybody's spirits, especially mine. It's kind of like, okay, we, we got a fighting chance. We're back in the game again. So it kind of needed that shot of confidence so we can get after him again. Okay, Anselm, how far is it going to be before we get to water, mate? Another 20 miles. No, 20 miles, and you yep. reckon that's where exactly where he's heading? That's where he's heading. Okay, uh, we're probably not going to make it there before dark, are we? No, we won't. We'll so we're going to have to set up camp. up camp? Yep. Where's the best place that you'd recommend to set up camp where we're not going to have any snakes or any problems? Uh, just further up here. Okay. Right, we'll start a fire and then we'll see where we go from there. Right up. He's going to travel quite a bit of ground tonight, don't you think? Yep. He'll probably get to that water before we get to it. Yep, he won't stop. Anselm and Clinton ride west, following the path of the traditional landowner's route back towards Kings Creek Station. <laughs> I'm 
With the night closing in, Clinton and Anselm decide it's time to set up camp. What are you looking for in a camp, mate? Uh, somewhere where there's a windbreak, yep. shelter from the rain, maybe a cave. Yep. Somewhere where we can find some firewood. Yep. Yep. We could better get something to eat then pretty soon, eh? Yeah. We'll have to make some more smoke too. Right. What are we going to make the smoke for? So the other mob can find us. Okay. Well, I bet that horse is going to beat us to the water. He's going to get there tonight before us. Yeah, sure. I tell you, I'll be looking for a rest after today. In order to signal where we were, Anselm lit a big fire, created a lot of smoke, and that let the other people in our tracking party know exactly where we were so they could locate us. Anselm did a great job uh, with the smoke, getting everybody to come into the camp, let everybody know where we were, but he was pretty much aware that if we did not get him the next day, we weren't gonna get him. Too much time had gone past now, and he traveled too far away from the yard that if we did not get him the next day, the trip was pretty much over. Clinton Anderson, world-renowned horseman, has designed one of today's most unique handcrafted saddles. Combining time-worn traditions with the latest innovations in saddle making, Clinton and Martin Saddlery have created the ultimate Aussie saddle, hand-tooled, double-stitched out of premium leather. It's tree handcrafted from Dakota pine. The perfectly engineered fiberglass seat guarantees a natural fit. Eliminates pressure points. This is a saddle built with real life in mind. It gives a rider unique balance, security, comfort, a strong seat, and a perfect fit. Maximizing performance for you and your horse through coordinated movement. A secure and balanced seat. Free range of motion, just as nature intended. Clinton Anderson combines the perfect combination of Aussie and American saddle making. Clinton Anderson Aussie Saddle, made exclusively for down under horsemanship. Call or click to order today, or shop our store at a Clinton Anderson tour event near you. Down Under Horsemanship's Australian Outback Adventure is brought to you by Richie Industries. Fresh water for life. Clinton and Anselm have spent all day tracking the rogue, but it is getting dark, and they'll have to camp for the night. And Anselm has lit a fire to send smoke signals to the other trackers so that they can find the campsite, so that they can have a planning meeting about how to proceed. Anselm, we made pretty good progress today, didn't we, mate? Yep. Where do you think he's following those tracks? Where, where's he going? Oh, he's going to a waterhole. Do you know which one? Yeah, I know which one. Is it a permanent waterhole? Permanent. How many more uh, days do you think it's going to take for us to get him? I think one more day will get us pretty close. Okay, mate. I hope yeah. so. I'm really looking forward to getting this horse. Me too. Yeah. How far do you think those Brumbies can go in a day, mate? 30, 40 miles easily. Yeah? Yeah, not hard for so that. So they're, they're pretty fit then. They can travel some miles. Yeah, they can. All right, well, we're going to have to stay on if we're going to have to keep up with him. Way to go. You know, some of the guys barely made it into the camp before dark. You know, they basically got in just in a nick of time. And then I come here to them and I look at the bread like them. In the post, I look at them, tie the melon, melon, mouse the melon, and I go into the room. Breaking the tomb. Mm hmm. Right, I'm going to make it back here. I see you guys saw the, saw the smoke that Anselm yeah. did. Yeah. Good to see you, fellas. Yeah. Good to see you. Yep. Right. We didn't day. think we'd make it back. Yeah, it's a good smoke. Well, like the hours, were, though. I mean, after <laughs> lighting that smoke, we come over and uh, you're not here. Where the hell have you been? Well, I'm going to be honest, I was lost about a dozen times so far today. <laughs> and if it wasn't for this guy, I wouldn't have made it here. Right. Now, have we got any food, Ian? Yeah, we got food. She's cooking already. That night, we all sat around the fire. We talked more about the rogue Brumby, and we came up with, you know, a new strategy and, uh, you know, crossed our fingers to hope that the new strategy was going to work. Well, so far, Ian, uh, We've, we've got him, but then we lost him. So that's pretty much on your end. I've got to be honest about that. Well, I got him in, you got you lost him. I didn't lose him. Remember, I didn't lose him. So don't put the bloody... They were your men. Hey, They're hey, under hey. your guidance. Yeah, but... That, uh, yeah, but the yeah. reality is... We know where he's gone. Yeah, yeah we, we do. Well, yeah. I don't. Us old, us old blokes know exactly where he is. Well, we just want you young fellas to start mm -hmm. to look, you know, 
It's the one that they saw the smoke. Right. How are they going to yeah. find his hole? In the cataracts. He'll yeah. be up to yeah. 90 mile by that big water. Well, we've got to get him tomorrow, that's for sure. I down near that bloody uh, Mayfield swamp. Yeah, 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 right yeah, that, yeah that big clay pan. Yep, on the big clay pan, near, smel near Smelly Hill. Mm. Yeah, that's where we'll find the bugger. Right, well, let's get it tomorrow, because i got to get on with this challenge. I can't be over here all year, Ian. I've got to win this challenge and get home. Well, the way you're going at the moment, mate, you'll win nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Dave had a lot of knowledge about the Brumby in Australia as well, so I really did enjoy talking to him as well and, and picking up some more information about it. How did Brumbies actually get their name? Like, we call them Mustangs in America. How did Brumbies become Brumbies? How did they get that name? Well, years ago, a couple hundred years ago, a bloke called Brumby had some horses down near Sydney and he let them go. Right. And they went wild and everyone called them Brumby's horses. And they called the place where the Brumbies ran, Brumbies Run. Okay. So people brought them out here and they, they used to breed horses out in the bush. So right. they, they weren't, mostly they weren't really wild. They were run in and they were broken in and they were used for stock work. And then turned loose again. Yeah, and they, they were bred in the wild. But about uh, after the Second World War, uh, increased mechanisation. They didn't use horses as much. You know, motorbikes, helicopters came in. And through the 70s, they had 10 years of really good rain and then Brumby numbers just built up in Central Australia. And by 1984, there were over 80,000 horses in yeah. Central Australia here. The last estimate for horses was 350,000, but mm -hmm. that was 20 years ago. So nobody knows right now. There could be a million. Mm -hmm. Like in North America, they got 30,000 in the right. wild. Right. We might have a million wild horses in yeah. Australia. Well, I tell you what, I've had enough for tonight and we've got to get after it tomorrow because we've got to get back to this challenge and uh, we've got to get this horse. It's as simple as it gets because I didn't come over here for nothing and Ian, uh, Ian and I have got a bet and I plan to win it, but unless I can get this damn horse, we can't get, we can't get a train. So let's get to bed tonight, fellas. Let's get up in the morning, let's get after it and me and you are going to get onto it and uh, hopefully Ian will stay out of our way and we'll try to get this thing caught. <laughs> And we'll be in good shape. If you have trouble, mate, just give us a call. I'll, yeah. you know, I'll get the old bikes on it. Right, yeah. right, I'll do that. Go Listen, ahead. fellas, have a good night tonight. Keep the snakes out of your swag, and uh, we'll get after it in the morning, eh? Fresh water on demand is critical for your horse's health. Make sure it's always available when you install Richie Waters. We've got the model to suit your needs, whatever they may be. Get the most energy efficiency with the new Eco Fount series. Get the benefits of both steel and poly construction with the Omni Fount. Get the best combination of value and performance with the Watermatic. And for delivering water directly to your horse, there's our newly redesigned Stall Fount. Richie set the standard in quality when we invented the automatic waterer in 1921, and we've been the industry leader ever since. So when you buy a Richie, you know you're getting the most dependable product on the market, not to mention the best value, service, and warranty in the business. After all, water is essential. We make it easy. Right, mate, I got a good feeling. You think we're getting pretty close to him? Yeah, he's pretty close now, so once we spot him, just call Ian in. Right, we got to get him the second time. Yep. Right, mate, let's get after him. Well, after a good night's rest, Ansel and I got up and we said, you know what, this is our last day and we're going to give it everything we got. Anselm and I came across a desert spring. It basically happens every full moon out in the middle of the outback. And uh, it's a place where the horses and all animals can drink from. So he felt pretty confident enough to analyze in the hoof prints that the rogue Brumby was there. He might have had a couple of mares with him and started to form a new band again. And uh, he traveled through that area. What do you think of these tracks here, Anselm? Yeah, he's come along here. He's got two mares with him. Right. He's come to water here. So where, where is this water coming from then? Oh, that's a spring, it's coming out from the ground. Right. Yeah, and uh, when there's a full moon, that's when it comes out. When there's nothing, then animals and that will have to dig for it. Okay. Yeah. And so is this a reliable water source or it's, it's, it comes and goes? It comes and goes. Okay. Okay, so he's, he's drunk here with those couple of mares. And then where do you think he's gone from here, mate? I think he's gone over those ridges there. Righto. 
All right, let's go track it there then. Where, where are we going? Which direction is this, mate? I can it'll go up over this. We'll be looking for a place to graze now. Right. To help track the rogue, somebody comes up with a strategic tactic idea to triangulate the area. Towards the end, we pretty much felt like we had the horse within a two mile radius. So what we did is we split up into three groups and kind of formed a triangle around where we thought he was. And we basically just kept moving in a circular motion around him and kept narrowing the distance that he could escape from. And we, we hope that that theory of just closing in, closing in, closing in, but all of us keep moving around at the same time was going to work. And it ended up working really well. But Clinton and Ian and the rest of the team are about to see why the Aboriginal trackers are the best in the world. You know, the Aboriginals were pretty confident, uh, to be honest with you. They had more confidence than what I had that we were going to capture him again. <laughs> Like many traditional landowners, these men are in tune with the environment and have a sixth sense and epitomize the spirit of the area in honing in on this horse. And they're familiar with the location of good lookout posts where one can see the entire valley clearly to see the big picture. But with this road getting further away with every passing hour, time is running out to find this horse. The manhunt fans out to bring the rogue in. Where's Clinton Anderson? Oh, there he goes on the horse over there. Look at him. What actually caught us off guard is that the horse actually had started to double back towards the second mustering site, and we didn't expect that. So when we did find him and locate him, we got on the radio, we let Ian know, we let the choppers know so that they could come in and kind of help get behind him and me on a horse so we could get him back into the yards again. Hey, Clinton. What? You see him over there? Are you Call sure? Him. That's him? Yep. Ian, we found him, mate. Yeah, got you, Clinton. Get the choppers in the air, OK? I'll send the choppers up to meet you, and I'll send the quad bike and so on to meet you as well. Uh, when you get closer, we'll meet you with the bull catchers, and we'll push him straight in the yard. Copy. We're going to get after him right now. We don't have much time. Cheers. Come on, let's go. Having traveled a total of 100 kilometers, they're really close to finally capturing this horse. Warwick scrambles two R22 choppers. Ian and David drive bull catchers. And Clinton and Anselm take horseback. Now the ultimate catch was getting to ride the wild brumbies right up through that canyon and get them captured on horseback. We had to track a wild problem stallion, get him caught up, get him through the canyon, and get him into a place where we could contain him. And being able to do that on horseback with the assistance of the helicopters and the bull catchers was one of the greatest feelings in the world. You know, that's the ultimate goal, is to be able to ride behind a bunch of wild animals, wild horses that have never been tamed before, and get them into a containment, make sure they're safe, they're not hurt, and then start building a partnership with them. It doesn't get any better than that. Me and Anselm spent, you know, many, many hours together, several nights tracking him, figuring out where he was going. And uh, that was an adventure on its own by itself. But, you know, it was kind of lucky that we got him back again. After successfully recapturing him again, to say that I was anxious to get in the round pen and start working with him would be an understatement. I wanted to start the method on this horse like right now, okay? I wanted to do the job that I came over to get done. I actually had one of my Balin round pens flown all the way from America to Australia to actually work with this horse when I started the method. Well, it looks like it's me and you now, mate. Let's get on with it. I wanted to make sure that he wasn't going to escape again, and I'm glad that I brought the Balin round pen over. 
When you're dealing with extreme horses and livestock, you want the best equipment. So I'm glad that the Balin Round Pen came over with me and uh, I was able to use it. Down Under Horsemanship's Australian Outback Adventure has been brought to you by Ritchie Industries. Fresh water for life. Now, because he's never been around man before, everything we do with him, he's gonna be frightened of. Wild Brumbies can jump pretty high. I'm gonna pressure him here, pressure him here. And then leave him alone over there. We had Balin ship over one of my round pens all the way from the States for that reason right there. Later on, when I get a halter on him, I'm gonna be able to shut his feet down. And that'll be the third area that we'll use to control his mind. Talk about being in the middle of nowhere, we're here. Now, the, the main population right now is just the damn flies. We're out in the middle of nowhere. Ring. <laughs> Hello? Siri not available. <laughs> Leon, we're out here in the middle of the outback, mate. Out in the middle of nowhere. What's the time? Well, it's 10 past two, mate. When's the plumber showing up? Are you supposed to look at your <laughs> watch? <laughs> I ain't got a watch. Don't ask me what. Well, ask me the time. I was, I was gonna say, we're out here in the middle of the outback. <laughs> and it's like, what, what's the time?